November 13, 2007. California State University, Long Beach. Jim Gilchrist, co-founder of the Minutemen, and Enrique Morones, founder of Border Angels. Debate on Immigration. Well, there was supposed to be a debate. In opening remarks, the moderator stated that the event's goal was to give each panelist and their respective views equal time during the forum. But that's before Morones and his Open Borders pals hijacked the event. Mr. McLean, you told me I was going to do the opening. I believe we agreed that you would do the closing. Uh, you told me that I'd do the opening statement. And I'd like to do the opening statement. Mr. Gilchrist, will you agree? I'll concede. And made sure he got his say first, in Spanish. Morones proceeded to give his opening statement, graciously switching to English at an American college where classes are taught in English, which consisted of a rant about how racist the Minutemen are and personal attacks and name-calling directed at Gilchrist and Minuteman co-founder Chris Simcox. Chris Simcox, the co-founder of the movement, he has had restraining orders issued by his first wife for sexual molestation of his daughter, the other co-founder, Jim Gilchrist, is a person, an immigrant himself, who also has had mental problems. He was the laughingstock of the military when he was there, often referred to as Gober Pyle, or Ted Hayes, Choose Black America. These are racist organizations. Then, in the name of all those things that colleges say they're all about, tolerance, the sharing of ideas, and honest debate, Morones walks out of the debate in which he agreed to participate, taking his open borders audience fillers with him. I don't want to hear him spread his lies. I say we walk out and say no to this type of a situation. No. And what is the lesson we learn from the courageous way in which Morones met his opponent head on? in a passionate exchange of ideas. If you can't support your position, take over the debate. Tell people what you think about the other guy and run away! Some students had the right idea though. Catherine Marroquin, 18. I wanted to hear what this guy was about. I wanted to hear straight from his mouth. Hector Gomez, 21. From what I saw, it was more of a trap. If there was a fair debate, I would have stayed. And then there's this gem from Norma Chinchilla, professor of sociology and women's studies. We didn't come together around immigration. We came together around human rights and keeping our campus a place where hate does not exist. Where hate doesn't exist, Norma, or just hate that you don't approve of? The victim, Nathan Sidempol, a seven-year-old California boy. The accused, Candidio Renteria Parasa, illegal alien from Mexico. The crime, murder. The story. On July 23, 2004, the seven-year-old was riding his bicycle on the sidewalk when Parasa, driving a Chevrolet Suburban, hit the boy, knocking him from his bike, and ran over him. Parasa stopped his vehicle momentarily drove over the child a second time, then fled the scene. Nathan was pronounced dead at a local hospital. Police have been unable to locate Parasa, but say that he has family in several nearby towns. They say he could be living in the community undetected, or he may have fled to his native Mexico. We may not know where he is now, but we know where he's been. Parasa previously served two years in prison for drug trafficking and was deported in 1999. Of course, if our government had been doing its job, getting and keeping illegal aliens out of our country, Parasa wouldn't have been here to callously take the life of a seven-year-old boy, then drive off into the sunset, making this crime 100% preventable. The victim, a 13-year-old California boy. The criminal, Jesus Mora Nava, 30, illegal alien from Mexico. The crime. Two counts of a forcible lewd act with a child under 14 and using false documents to conceal immigration status. The story. 
On July 17th, Nava approached a 13-year-old boy outside his middle school, asking if he had any drugs. The boy said no, and Nava left. He returned, this time offering the child beer, which he refused. Again, Nava left, then persistently returned a third time to press the 13-year-old boy to drink alcohol with him. Nava enticed the child into a canyon near the middle school, where transient migrant workers notoriously make camp, stopping to buy more beer and hard liquor on the way. Then the 30-year-old got the 13-year-old drunk enough to pass out and repeatedly sodomized him. A jogger observed the boy stumbling out of the brush, bleeding, and offered assistance. A sheriff's helicopter equipped with a heat-seeking sensor located the child molester in the area later the same day. For pleading guilty, Nava faces a maximum of 16 years at his sentencing on January 3rd. After serving his sentence, he will, of course, be eligible for deportation. We can only hope that by that time, deportation will actually mean something. Because if our government had been doing its job, getting and keeping illegal aliens out of our country, Nava wouldn't have been here to lure a 13-year-old boy away from his school, to get a 13-year-old boy drunk, and to rape a 13-year-old boy repeatedly, making this crime 100% preventable. Did you ever wonder what it's like being a Border Patrol agent? What do agents contend with on a daily basis? And just how dangerous is it when your job is to protect the borders of our sovereign nation? Jerry Saper of the Washington Times tackled the topic this week, and it left us with a newfound respect for those who are willing to do this job that consistently puts them in harm's way. We've previously reported about attacks on agents at the border, and that such violent attacks have more than doubled over the past several years. Sean P. Moran, vice president of the San Diego local of the National Border Patrol Council, says that violence by alien and drug smugglers includes assault rifles, Molotov cocktails, and rocks. As a matter of fact, he reports that rockings are so commonplace that agents rarely report them anymore, that if they did, they'd spend all their time writing up the reports instead of enforcing the border. But that's not all. Moran describes our agents on the border as being outmanned and outgunned. And Border Patrol agents themselves say that although Washington has increased the number of agents, their numbers have actually decreased at some crucial spots on the border. Moran adds that with agents being assaulted four to five times per shift, it's only a matter of time before one is killed by someone intent on their smuggling operation not being stopped by our lawmen. We thank those lawmen for attempting to do a job that is being made virtually impossible by our own government, for doing the increasingly difficult job of maintaining our law and border. New York Governor Elliot Spitzer was left spluttering this week as his driver's licenses for illegal alien scheme was met with a resounding hell no from the citizens. On the issue of driver's licenses for illegal aliens, we suggest taking a good hard look at Mexico, where foreigners must present a valid visa to get one. An anti-illegal immigration warrior and presidential candidate, Tom Tancredo, was blasted for a new ad in which he states that our wide open borders may be an invitation for terrorists to harm Americans. That man has some nerve telling the truth like that. Thanks for clicking in to this week's episode of the Blogs for Borders video blog burst. The stories that we focus on here by nature tend to be negative. But as Thanksgiving is just a few days away, we want to stop and tell you what we're thankful for. So many patriots fighting this good fight. That amnesty after amnesty is being defeated. And that immigration is a topic that our presidential candidates cannot avoid talking about. That's what we give thanks for. And we give thanks for you watching our show. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next week.